Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, looking back and acting forward, how Remembrance Scholars are honoring the 35 students who died on Pan Am Flight 103. And the CDC has new masking guidelines, why they're in effect, and what it means for Central New Yorkers. And before the snow hits, a fall festival is back in town, and this year, it's spooky. All that, plus your weather and orange sports, coming up on this week's edition of Mornings on the Hill. It starts right now. I'm Sammy St. Jean. Thanks for joining us here on Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Michael Villegas. Let's get right to our top story. Solemn ceremonies on campus this week as we remember the lives lost aboard Pan Am 103. This is Remembrance Week with students asked to look back and act forward. It's in honor of the lives lost aboard the plane brought down by a terrorist bomb in December of 1988. This week has been filled with events to remember the students who died along with hundreds of other people on the plane and on the ground. This week culminates the Rose Lang Ceremony at the Remembrance Wall. It takes place Friday at 2.03. It's the exact same time the plane was brought down. Eleven counties in New York, including Onondaga County, are marked as having high community transmission of COVID-19 by the CDC this week. Mornings on the Hill reporter Jeremy Lynch joins us now in studio with, this, with what this means. Jeremy? Thanks guys. This means people living in Onondaga County are recommended to mask up again at this time since there's an increase of hospitalizations due to COVID-19. The CDC says that regardless of community transmission rate, people should stay up to date on COVID vaccinations, including boosters. The CDC also recommends that a person should wear a high quality respirator or mask and avoid contact with COVID positive individuals in these areas of high transmission. They also recommend that if you are at risk for higher if you are at a higher risk for severe disease, to avoid non-essential in-person indoor events. Onondaga County is not the only county in New York that has a high community transmission rate. Pete Tedeschi is a student at the University of Albany, which is also under high community transmission. He believes that masks should be mandated in high community transmission areas due to new variants. It's a selfless act for what you're doing and that the world does not revolve around you. Other people could have health risks. And if you go in the store, like knowing, not even knowing that, you can put someone's life at risk. So that's why I say you all should take COVID seriously. Community transmission data is updated weekly on Thursdays on the CDC webpage. Reporting live from the studio, I'm Jeremy Lynch for Mornings on the Hill. Back to you at the desk. Thanks, Jeremy. And right on campus, protesters held signs less than 24 hours ago in support of aborted fetuses. They were spotted by some unhappy students standing right outside the Shine Student Center. These people believe that a third of a generation has been killed by abortion. It's really upsetting because it's not only not true, it feels like they don't believe in women's rights as well, which is heartbreaking. Um, they're disregarding the fact that one in four um, pregnancies is a miscarriage and all these procedures to help a miscarriage are the same procedures as abortion. Protesters had signs over their mouths saying life in red. They had signs saying this was the day of life, silent solidarity. The protesters started outside the Hall of Languages, but DPS moved them to Shine and then the corner of University and Waverly Ave. They say this was because one of the protesters wasn't a student and by six at night they were gone. How about that weather out there? I saw your ears this morning. <laughs> they were pretty red. It was very red. The walk was very brisk. And uh, Florida boy, I am not cold. And like many of you at home, I probably brought out all the winter clothes out of my closet today. Yeah, for Massachusetts, I'm used to it, but not used that to used to it. Not that <laughs> to you. A little undergrad in Pennsylvania. Mornings on the Hill reporter Zick Richter joins us live from the weather deck with more Zach. Good morning, Michael and Sammy. Right now, as we take a look outside, it is really chilly, and it was even colder this morning around 6 a.m. It was 37 degrees, but temperatures have climbed up since then. Now, taking a look at our current temperatures here in Syracuse, 44 degrees, so there has been a rise since then, and it feels like 39 degrees. Our humidity is at 63%, our dew point at 32, and winds around 9 miles an hour, but those are going to increase throughout the day. 
However, even though we have the cold right now, our warm temperatures are going to come back this weekend. I'll have more on that and your five day forecast coming up in just a bit. But Michael Sammy, I'll send it back over to you for now. Thanks, Zach. The Chuck Hafner Fall Festival has returned for the first time since before the pandemic. Morning's on the Herald Porter, Micah Prine Goldstein joins us now live in studio. Micah. Thanks guys. The Chuck Hafner Fall Festival is the only free festival that is also indoors this Halloween season. Located in North Syracuse, the festival emphasizes the importance of including the whole family. Their campus is wheelchair accessible. After a brief hiatus for the pandemic, the Chuck Hafner's Fall Festival is back and has something for the whole family. Program coordinator Janissa Hart tells me why this year is One different than all. One of the things that's fairly new that we brought back that was a huge hit was uh, Repco Wildlife Center comes with um, snakes, spiders, lizards. Uh, it's a free show on the weekends that kids uh, can actually interact with the creatures and touch them, which is really, really cool. Aside from playing with the creepy crawlies, the festival also has something for the traditional Halloween fan. They have pumpkin picking, a corn maze, and a haunted wax museum exhibit. In years past, the festival has focused on their own, but this year the festival is allowing local vendors to sell their own Halloween-themed food and drink. The festival coordinator, Janessa Hart, let me know she is excited to welcome back the local community and feels this could be Hafner's best. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Micah Prine Goldstein. Back to you. Thank you, Micah. Coming up on Mornings on the Hill, how can you show support for dating and domestic violence awareness month? And popping tags for a cause. We'll have the details in just a few minutes. Stay here right with us for when we get back. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. A local thrift store north of Syracuse's proceeds go to an animal rescue. Mornings on the Hill reporter Sydney Staples joins us live from the studio to tell us more. Sydney. Kirkville Animal Rescue and Education needed a way to support their animals and creating a thrift store was the answer. Bill Animal Rescue and Education started in 2010, but in 2020, the pandemic made it difficult to find food for both its barnyard and exotic animals. Jody Gamina opened a thrift store called Monkey See, Monkey Do It Again to help. Everything we do is for the animals. Like, we don't even go out to dinner because everything goes to the animals, you know? So it's, um, it's been like that for years. I was looking for a way to help recoup the donations we lost during COVID. How can we make money to support the animals? As all the prices are rising, we needed a way to bring in money. So I mentioned to some of my friends, this is what I was thinking. And they all came together in such a big way to help me collect items. They donated, there was just so much and it all came together and here we are. This thrift store has been open since July 1st of this year. And Jill Wagner has known about CARE for over the past two decades. First time I ever heard about it as far as in this area. I, had, I was telling her, I, a friend of mine did it years ago. Um, and so I remember being around the monkeys and how cute they were. And so I'm familiar with it, but that was ooh, probably 25 years ago. While she loves thrift shopping, she also loves animals. And she felt better knowing that she was giving to a good cause. All proceeds and donations go directly to CARE. Sydney Staples, Mornings on the Hill. Thank you, Sydney. Time to check your weather for today. Mornings on the Hills, Zach Richter joins us again in the studio to give us your full weather forecast. Zach. Yeah, thanks guys. Right now, as we take a look at our high temperatures for today, it's going to go up to 48, which is a little chilly. But for him for this time of year, with our average being 59, our record high today was 81, and our low today is going to be 40. And that's just around our, our average, which was 41, and our record low today was 22 degrees. Now, moving to our hourly forecast today, it was 48. It's going to go up to 48 around 3 p.m., and we could even heat 50 by 5 p.m., and then it's going to drop again overnight, and we're going to get to 39 degrees in the early morning hours of tomorrow, and then temperatures are going to keep going up. We could see up to 51 degrees by around 3, 5 o'clock tomorrow, and then temperatures will continue to drop down. Now moving to our regional temperatures across central New York, Syracuse coming in at 43, Albany 45, Watertown 43, Rome 40, Binghamton 41, Elmira 42, and Buffalo 42. So they're all around in the low 40s except Glen Falls, which is in the high 30s. 
as we take a look at our five day forecast for for this week. Wednesday high 48 and some rain possibly this afternoon. Thursday high 47 with some clouds and then the sun will come out on Friday with a high of 62. Saturday though temperatures start to get warmer as we could see up to the 70s on Saturday, Sunday through next Tuesday. That's all I got for weather. Sammy, Michael, I'll send it back over to you. Thanks, Zach. Governor Kathy Hochul recently approved adult use cannabis dispensaries in the state of New York. Our mornings on the Hill reporter Isabel Flores joins us now in studio with more. Isabel. Thanks, guys. I was able to catch up with individuals in the business of selling cannabis as well as cannabis paraphernalia to see how they think these new cannabis dispensary approvals will affect profit. Smoke shops are popular amongst residents in Syracuse, with there being one on almost every corner. As new approvals for adult-use cannabis dispensaries take place, smoke shops could be impacted. Samantha Pitcher, a cashier at New York Exotic Smoke Shop, says that the establishment of cannabis dispensaries will help boost business by introducing the sale of marijuana. I think it will boom our business and other businesses because everybody will go out and get their license to sell it and make a lot more profit for their stores. Stephen Keegan, a cashier at Empire Hookah, says he doesn't think the dispensaries will bring much of a difference to smoke shops. Smoke shops is different from dispensaries. Dispensaries only could sell marijuana products. They can't sell pipes or bongs or anything like that. Owner of I'm Stuck Weed Warehouse, David Tully says that the new dispensary approvals aren't truly helping disenfranchised individuals like they were originally planned to. They gave all their first conditional licenses, all to hemp people that already had hemp, and hemp licenses for the last two years. Those are not disenfranchised people. Those are not poor people. Governor Kathy Hochul plans to approve and establish at least 20 dispensaries before the end of 2022 and plans to establish many more throughout the new year. While many are still skeptical of these plans to open such a large amount of dispensaries by the end of the year, others seem excited for the change. Sammy, Michael, back to you. Thanks, Isabel. We're about halfway through Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Tomorrow, Purple Thursday, students are encouraged to wear purple to show their support for those victimized by relationship violence. In the country, one in three women are victimized by domestic violence each day, as well as one in four men. MSNBC anchor Kathy Turr spoke at Newhouse last night as part of the Deanne Gamble Gitner Storytelling Symposium. The discussion centered around if journalism can survive this partisan era. Turr is also a New York Times bestselling author, a rough draft and memoir. You can watch Kathy every weekend at 2 p.m. on MSNBC. Kathy Turr visits Newhouse. Six and oh. Coming up after. Coming up after the break, we will be looking at some recaps from the weekend and a big win from the Syracuse Orange football team. Stay tuned. <music> Women's soccer came out just short of champions in last week's game. Good morning, I'm Jayla Pettis with your Orange Sports Update. Women's soccer returned home last Friday to play against the Clemson Tigers. Graduate student Jenna Tivenin received a corner kick from junior Kate Murphy with 15.58 remaining to tie the game. The team's current record is 8-5-1 and, and in the ACC, 1-4-2. Syracuse will head to Pittsburgh to play this Thursday night at 6. Moving on to men's soccer, they are currently ranked number four and had a matchup last night against Bucknell. Senior forward Levante Johnson led the Orange with two goals to beat their opponent 2-1. The team's current record for the season is 12-2-1. Syracuse is on the road this Saturday to face NC State. Women's volleyball traveled to the Carolinas this past weekend where they played UNC Chapel Hill. Syracuse won 3-2 in their match. Graduate student Paulina Shimanova led the Orange with 21 kills. Their next game will be this Friday at Clemson. Cuse fans, we are going bowling this year. The Orange dominated on Saturday with a 24-9 win over NC State, earning them bowl eligibility. This is their first 6-0 run since 1987. In addition, Syracuse football is now ranked number 14 in the AP poll. Our Maddie Mushin is live at the Dome to talk more about the iconic win. 
Thanks, Jayla. If you weren't in the dome this past Saturday, then you can probably hear better than those of us who were. At one point, the volume of the dome reached a level of 121, which is uncomfortable according to the American Academy of Audiology. And that, in comparison, is the same volume level as a jet plane taking off, which helped Syracuse in their win over NC State. We, we couldn't have done it without them. The, one of my, back seven years ago when I wanted to come here, one of the advantages of this institution is home games in that dome. And when it is field like that, it is a presence. It is a true 12th man. The dome, the JMA, the Syracuse University, that is a true 12th man. Head coach Dino Babers talked about this idea of a 12th man in the dome. If you're unfamiliar with the term, it refers to the home team's fans and the advantage that they give when playing at home. This advantage was seen on Saturday in the sold-out dome for Syracuse's sixth win of the season, beating NC State 24-9. Syracuse is now 6-0, their best start since 1987. Quarterback Garrett Schrader led the team to the victory after he threw for 210 yards and two touchdowns. Oronde Gadsden also made an impact in the game, including two touchdowns with eight receptions and 141 yards. Sean Tucker was once again pleased with his performance after rushing for 98 yards and a touchdown. Syracuse now looks ahead to this weekend as they travel to Death Valley to take on Clemson, who is ranked number five in the nation. They have lost the last four games against Clemson, and since 2013, the Orange have only beaten the Tigers once back in 2017 at the Dome. This game will determine the front runner in the ACC as both Syracuse and Clemson are undefeated thus far. Syracuse takes on Clemson in Death Valley this Saturday at noon on ABC. Reporting outside the Dome for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Maddie Muschin. Thanks, oh. Maddie. Still to come here on Moorings on the Hill, Broadway seems to be on the incline and decline. Learn which shows and successful are successful and which shows aren't. And the Mornings on the Hill staff answer what their favorite Halloween candy is. That story more just ahead on Mornings on the Hill. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. The Broadway world has been changing a lot the past few months. Our Mornings on the Hill entertainment reporter Zach Richter joins us now in studio with more. Zach? Yeah, thanks guys. Good morning. There's been a lot of change already since the start of this Broadway season. Looking at the numbers from this week ending on October 9th, according to the Broadway League, out of the 25 productions playing, they have to an average of 92% capacity. Music Man, Hamilton, and Lion King continue to lead the Broadway box office, grossing around two to three million dollars. Since the 2022 Tony Awards, the thriller MJ, based on Michael Jackson's life, coming in at 1.8 million for the week ending October 9th, and has made at least 1.4 million this past week and played to over 100% capacity again. Now, the Tony Award winner for Best Musical from the Spring, A Strange Loop, made 770000 in the week ending October 9th. And The Kite Runner continues to struggle at the box office, making 330000 with its closing date set for just a couple weeks away. Hadestown, which was making over a million back in the spring, is now 850000 in last week. And then Into the Woods continues to do really well, making $1.2 million with its news class. Now, with a lot of Broadway shows closing recently, I now want to take a look at what is coming to Broadway first. Take Me Out, which opens on October 27th. The show first closed last spring and is coming back to Broadway for another limited run starring Jesse Tyler Ferguson and Jesse Williams. The show is centered around a mixed race baseball star who comes out as gay. And Juliet is opening October 28th, which centers around what if Juliet didn't die at the end of the story. Then there's a beautiful noise opening November 2nd, which centers around the life of the legendary Neil Diamond. And next, Almost Famous, which is set to open November 3rd and is based off the 2000 film of the same name. Lastly, K-pop displays the history of the K-pop genre through song and is set to open on, October, on November 20th. And now to a developing story. Broadway star Patti Lapone has announced she is stepping away from Broadway stage. On Monday, Lapone says she resigned from the labor union actors months ago. This comes after Lapone refused to continue to star in Broadway's production of Company after the Broadway League removed the show's mass mandate, forcing the closure of the show this past July. Lapone wrote on her Twitter, quote, 
she gave up her equity card and no longer part of that circus. Now, and the Broadway League has announced the date for the 14th annual Jimmy Awards. The Jimmy Awards celebrates high school theater around the country and gives teens a chance to pursue their dreams. The ceremony will take place on June 26th of next year at the Miskoff Theater on Broadway, beginning at 7.30. Sammy, Michael. Thanks, Zach. Our executive producer, Caitlin Parisi, went around and asked us a very important question leading up to the Halloween. Check out what the Moth Crew had to say. Favorite Halloween candy? If I had to go chocolate, it's probably a Three Musketeer, but if we're talking a sour candy, it's what? definitely Sour Patch Kids. My favorite is Reese's, but a slept on one is Smarties. Twix, and it's not even close, hands down Twix. Um, Reese's, not Reese's, Reese's. <laughs> I'll have to go with Kit Kats. All of the chocolate, just oh. all of it. <laughs> um, probably Charleston Chew. Um, honestly, peanut m &Ms. Reese's Cups. Kit Kat, for sure. Three Musketeers, all the way. <laughs> Professor Koblen? Sour Skittles. Now, I heard you say Twix. Yes. I don't, I don't know if I can, I'm gonna need you to justify it. 100% Twix, it's a cookie, it's chocolate, it's mixed together. Snickers is a close second. It's definitely a close second. I stick with my chocolates. I don't go venture out anywhere else. What about you? You know, I said Charleston Chews because that was just spur of the moment, but I really do love Milky Way too. Milky Way is probably my favorite candy. It is slept on as well. It is slept on as well. Okay, all chocolates in the freezer. I don't know if you guys are in on that. Reese's, Three Musketeers, Snickers in the freezer is dynamite. Gonna have to try that one out. Gonna have to do it. Um, but that is gonna do it for us here Wednesday on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Sammy St. Jean. Follow us on social media. I'm Michael Villegas. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday live at 10 a.m. right here on OTN. Thanks for watching.